I want your soul. Our sun has been acting up lately. Storms, flares, coronal mass ejections. I was told it was natural, nothing to worry about. We were just in a solar cycle and storms on the sun would get worse for a few more years until the cycle peaked. And gradually, solar activity will return to normal. But it's not so benign. At first, I thought the folks at NASA were keeping things hush-hush because of a potential Carrington event. A solar storm so powerful that it sends enough radiation to Earth to melt the energy grid and send us back into the Dark Ages. As horrifying as that sounds, such an event would be a comfort compared to the truth. Right now, I'm around 94 million miles from Earth. Some of you will realize about where that places me. We expected things to be bad, but not like this. Just a few hours ago, things were still normal. Our spaceship is so damn cramped. No, that's an understatement. It's coffin cramped. We sleep in bunks so tightly stacked that my nose touches the fabric of the cot above me. Coffin cramped, like I said. I'd called it that since launch, but the irony is just beginning to dawn on me now. There were four of us in this crew. Me, Margo, Ted, and Jin. At 1400 hours today, I felt like I was a little boy again, bickering with my sister on an airplane over the sunshade. But this was, of course, a little different. Please, Margo, I begged. We're restricted from opening any ports after 50 million miles. It's my job to enforce shit like that. I'm not trying to be the bad guy, I said. I was trying to act like I didn't want to open the port covering our spacecraft's only window because I was a bureaucrat. In reality, I was terrified of getting toasted by cosmic radiation. She gave me a pitying look. It was an expression that the rest of the crew had been giving me more and more as the mission went on. They knew more than me. I didn't get the same security clearance briefing as they did. I knew we were looking to retrieve an experimental probe that went dead in orbit around the sun, and that the plan was to retrieve the data it failed to relay, and then boomerang home using the sun. All in all, the mission would take most of a year. But I didn't get to know all the details. I'm not even an astronaut. I'm a hired gun. I spent a dozen years in the Army Special Forces retiring as a captain. My selection for this mission should have been the first red flag. But I was too busy thinking how awesome it would be to get to space. Besides, I made a living by not asking questions. I was told I would be the security specialist for the first space flight. I thought maybe all long missions needed someone like me. It made sense when you thought about it. You put four people in a tube for almost a year and fights are due to break out. Believe it or not, astronauts are not all timid geniuses. There are some gravitational egos floating around Earth's orbit in the ISS. My job was to keep everybody in check. Follow the rules, be civil or Murphy will handcuff you for a timeout. But 30 days before launch I was given a list. Things to look out for, signs and symptoms, kind of like that and I realized I was not just here to keep the peace. Of the more concerning bullet points were things such as this. If any crew member experiences bleeding that could be hemorrhagic, blood seeping from ears, eyes, or nose, or starts speaking in a strange way, mutterings, a throaty tone that sounds like another language, immediately quarantine them in their ECP. ECP stood for Emergency Containment Pod. In our tight little ship, six of these steel coffins were lined up in the wall, Opposite our bunks. Every place you could even fit a toothpick was important. So it was god-awfully concerning why so much space was allotted for those types of things. But before I saw any of this shit, the lists, the containment pods, the look of doom in the eyes of the other astronauts, the ink was dry. The contract was signed, and unless I wanted to fake an injury, there was no way out of this. It seemed like NASA was expecting madness on this mission, and my job was to keep it at bay. And speaking of those red flags, well, they kept coming one after another, like a clown with nothing but crimson scarves up its sleeve. If you're a big space nerd, you may have heard of the Parker Solar Probe. In 2018, a spacecraft the size of a sedan was launched with the intention of uncovering the mysteries of the sun's corona and solar wind, but it discovered something else. The probe went dark eight months ago. Me, the rest of the crew, and dozens of top scientists and brass were briefed with a PowerPoint composed of blurry images. Now the pictures weren't in 4K. The probe uses white light imaging that gives photos a grainy look like you're looking at the Loch Ness Monster. 
but with the help of a projector and nervous men with their pointer sticks, I was able to understand what exactly I was looking at. There was a black and white blur of stars in the background and coming out of them streaked by the speed at which it traveled was something that looked like a screaming human face and it was coming right for the probe. It was the last image that it took. Sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? But the room was quiet with fear. Nobody thought it was funny and no one seemed to offer an explanation for why the object that disabled the probe gave us all a bad case of facial periodalia. Its hollow eyes weren't level and its mouth was jagged. I thought it could be passed off as some kind of solar radiation interference. After all, no spacecraft or camera had ever been so close to the sun. But I didn't raise my hand, I sat quietly confused as they started talking about the distances between the eyes and the mouth. In the picture the thing looked close, like it might be 20 feet long. The room came alive with nervous murmurs as they concluded that the facial object that appeared in front of the probe was roughly the size of the Pacific Ocean, and so we wondered. Were there traveling gas clouds? Or was it radiation interference? But I didn't ask these questions. I'm not a scientist. It felt like every obvious answer was out the window. Otherwise, the room wouldn't have felt so eerie. They told us the probe was not destroyed and it was lingering in orbit, and our crew had the Herculean task of retrieving it. I was given a folder of the general mission plan and then dismissed along with dozens of others with low security clearance while the rest of the crew stayed sitting. I thought maybe we were going into technical details that I wouldn't understand. But as the days and meetings went on, and from the tight-lipped smiles I got in the halls, I knew I was told half of it. Looking at it now, it wouldn't have made a difference. Up until hours ago, I still knew nothing. Margo ignored my pleas to not open the sunshade and set her hand on the window switch. Visors, guys? I asked. The whole group was equipped with a gold visor, sunglasses on steroids as we called them. They allowed us to look out the window without being blinded by the sun. Hell, they were so effective we could stare at the sun if we wanted to. Ted and Jin nodded and donned their giant bug-eyed glasses. It was beginning to feel like we were on a suicide mission and I was the only one still ignorant to the fact. The cosmic radiation from the window, even for a few minutes, could cause serious complications down the line. But I didn't say anything. I nodded gently, defeated, and did as everybody else did. I flipped my goggles on and Margo hit the switch. An alarm sounded and the metal shade began to slip into the wall. We were all silenced by what we saw. No, my blood didn't run cold nor did my hair stand up on end, at least not from fear. Seventeen million miles away sat our sun, a silent ball of fire burning almost white against the blackness of space. From as close as we were, we could see the firestorm slowly swirling on its surface, systems of flames the size of Earth. And words can't do it justice. Mountains, stars, even the aurora borealis swimming pink paled in comparison to this view of space. The four of us had a moment gathered around the window, Four faces pressed against a porthole looking at beauty so incredible, it was truly indescribable. It was a while before any of us even spoke. Well, we should probably close this up, said Jen, radiation and all. Yeah, Ted snapped to attention like he'd been in a trance. The alarm blared and the metal shade returned to cover the glass, but I kept staring at where the sun was. Ted and Jen went back to the tiny table that folded out of the wall, where their poker hands sat dealt but untouched and looked at one another. It had been 122 days since launch and... We were sick of talking to each other. An hour went by and I tried to read, but quickly found myself getting warm. Ted, can you turn up the cold air? I said. These cooling units aren't meant to last much longer than the mission. We need to save for when it really gets hot, he replied. Is this not really hot? I shot back and Ted ignored me and I looked at the rest of the crew, but they just shrugged. Whatever, I muttered and started to read again. But twenty minutes later my stomach dropped. I was sweating so much I had to wipe my brow. There was a sheen of sweat on the back of my hand. I looked up with alarm and immediately locked eyes with Margot. She had her fingertip in front of her and she stared at a bead of sweat resting on the tip. It was getting really hot, far too fast. Before I spoke, the comm station crackled to life in electronic voice. Message incoming, it said. We were so far from Earth that radio transmissions weren't instantaneous. This billion dollar spaceship used what was essentially a fax machine to communicate with Earth. The screen led up with big letters we all could see. Base jumper, confirm your speed and location, it read. Ted rose from his seat with a start. I told you it was too hot, I muttered. Shut up. He went to the cockpit and checked some of the instruments before quickly speed walking back to the comm station. He typed furiously and spoke over his shoulder to us. We're off course and gaining speed, he said. What? You can't be serious. How much speed? I said. Ted leaned back from the screen, biting his lip. 200,000 kilometers an hour. 
Jesus, said Jin. That's the increase, not the total. We're at 320000 now, he said. Margot climbed into the cockpit and Ted took the seat next to her. Jin went to the instrument's wall just behind them and started giving readings. Everybody had a job here except me. Oh my god, we're being pulled in, Ted shouted. Cabin temperature rising 2.3 Celsius a minute, Jin said calmly. Don't worry folks, this thing is meant to withstand the heat from re-entry. A little sunshine ain't no thing, said Margot. But I could tell she was just trying to cool everybody off. There was terror in Ted's eyes darting wide. Engage starboard thrusters. Sunside, sunside, Ted said, and Margot flipped a series of switches. Thrusters are engaged. Give them it all, he said. Margot eased the throttle all the way up and the starboard wall began to roar. Although there was no difference in gravity or feeling, I clung like my life depended on it to the pole that supported our bunks. 3.4 Celsius a minute. Sir, I need to blast the cooling or we're going to bake, Jin said. Do it, Ted shouted. Jin furiously clicked a button sending the AC temp as low as it would go. It blew freezing air into the cabin. With the sound of thrusters in the cooling system, everyone put the radio sets on. I grabbed my headset off my bunk and moved the mic in front of my mouth. It just doesn't make sense. The thrusters changed our course by 0.1 degrees. We've already reverted, I said. Well, maybe there was a malfunction, Margot replied. Fuel levels suggest normal activation and all thruster sensors indicate they made it into position. Jin, said Ted. How long can that cooling system keep us at non-lethal temp, he asked. Well, that depends. If you want to be smart but uncomfortable, I can set it to keep the temp below 35 Celsius. We'd be hot, but we'll live, he said. Do it then. Okay, Ted. Roger that. Everybody was silent for a moment, and I hesitated to speak. Elements are a funny thing, and I was out of mind. I'm confident under gunfire when there's no evac, yet I felt like a child as these astronauts assessed the situation. So, what's the problem? I finally asked. Well, we're still off course. I can't... I don't have control of the ship, said Ted. Margot, Jan, and him all looked at each other. There was some kind of understanding in their eyes. A knowingness that this was going to happen. Think we're at the farm, Margot asked Ted, and he nodded ever so slightly. What farm, I asked. I didn't care about sounding naive anymore. I was too afraid. We're in a tractor beam, Ted flipped some switches off. The sound of the AC and the thrusters lessened, and he slipped his headset off and stood. We're being pulled by something now. You people have to talk to me. To where? Where are we being pulled to? I asked. Into the sun. Margot and Jin looked defeated. Ted opened the drawer in the wall that acted as his footlocker and pulled out a brown bottle of rum. Want to switch off the comm station, Jim? I swear we're bugged, he stated suspiciously. Oh. Jin powered off the comm station and then lit up buttons that all went dark. What's it matter anyways? Why are you all so calm? I asked inquisitively and sprang into the middle of the craft. I was beginning to get angry now. I had been the dumbest guy in the room for more than a hundred days and no one pretended otherwise. I was damn near at a breaking point. Murphy, Ted twisted the cork out of the rum bottle with an echoey pop. This wasn't a suicide mission. I want you to know that. Jen then held out a plastic cup and Ted splashed some rum in it. Something has been hiding behind the sun. Some structure. We know it can move, since the sun does too, and somehow it always manages to stay hidden though. Ted explained to me in non-astronaut terms. Ted then sighed and grabbed a plastic cup, filled it and put it in my hand, but I didn't drink it. He sighed again and then said that that probe that was launched a few years ago, the one we were supposed to retrieve, it wasn't sent to the study solar activity. It was sent to figure out what the hell our radar was detecting and why ever since the structure appeared, the sun had been going crazy with solar flares. To be honest, we still don't know, but we have a pretty good idea of what's happening. We have a theory. Okay, and what's the theory? The three of them then looked at each other and then looked at me, and I set my rum down. We think our sun is being mined. Mined? You mean, what do you mean mined? For energy? Yeah, that's right, for energy. Ted replied to my shock. There are so many others without intelligent species in orbit, but we figure out that they're so advanced that they don't care. Our sun was probably closest, the next gas station, so to speak. We're only theorizing here, but based on the strange and concerningly strong solar activity that's built up in the last few years, we can tell that something is definitely affecting the energy of that star. He stated matter-of-factly, even though he clearly didn't know for sure. So you don't know if any of this is true. What about the symptoms list I received? Where'd that come from? I said. And then I pointed to my list. The International Space Station is empty. It's evacuated. The astronauts there, they started bleeding and going mad just when the Parker Space Probe Capture that image. Hardly anyone knows this, but we are the only human beings in space right now. And Murphy, I really think you should drink that rum and try to calm down. Ted looked at me concerned and 
pointed to my cup. I picked up my cup and then drank the rum in one swift gulp. I held the cup out for more. Why me then? I mean, there were so many others to pick for this shit. And I'm not even an astronaut. Well, you'd be shocked at what percent of the special forces feels the psyche valve for going up in space. It's kind of disheartening to some people. You gotta be mentally tough, he said. Well, actually, I wouldn't. And we all laughed. What else could we do? We talked theories for the next few hours, what these aliens were doing, and what they needed the fuel for. A couple times Margot or Ted would head to the controls and try to deviate from our path to change our speed, but it was clear we were in the power of something else. Despite it all, I actually started to have a good time. We have a human need for levity in the face of death, and we quickly found ourselves drunk and laughing in hysterics. Okay, brass tacks everyone, said Jen after some hours passed and the laughter started to cool. We can't burn to death, and that's exactly what's going to happen if we stay on this course. There's no way we can make it quick by using the sun. Votes on cutting off the oxygen versus overriding the airlock. How do you guys want to die? He said and looked at us all. Oxygen, said Margo, and we all agreed. Okay, oxygen. Alrighty, said Jin, and I smirked then. I did not think my death would be decided with an alrighty, but after being in the fray so many years, I guess it felt right. I was surprised how well the crew was taking this. They were properly selected, and there was no panic. We were all just going to make our decision on how we were going to die, since there was no way to get off course, and we were going to burn to death anyways. And frankly, I didn't really want to burn to death. A couple minutes later, Jin got up from the table. We didn't realize he did it then, but over the next few minutes, our breaths became shallower and shallower. Wait, said Margot. She was suddenly swaying. Jin, did you already... But before she could finish her sentence, she hit the floor hard. At this point, there was terror in my mind for sure, but I did my best to ignore it. We typically don't discover this until the final seconds of our lives, but the human mind is an expert in experiencing death. I remember for some reason then, drunk and oxygen deprived, I was thinking of waking up with the windows open on a Sunday morning. It was a memory I had from high school, birds singing, bells tolling. A girl's arm gently curled on top of my chest. I was ready to die, but just then something heavy hit the top of the spacecraft. Sparks burst from the control panels and materials flew from their compartments. But it wasn't enough to keep me conscious. I fell to the floor and the world went dark. I woke to a shade being drawn. Darkness and then white. Unbearable light. It was the sunshade. I was still on the ship. Jim and Ted were on the floor on their backs. I stood clumsily over them and said, Guys, and I reached down to shake them but froze. Their eyes were gone and so were their brains. All that was left was red hollow sockets. These men had the eyes of jack-o'-lanterns. Oh, fuck, I said out loud and didn't know what to do. Shh, then I heard someone hushing me. My head snapped towards the source of the sound. It was Margot, standing at the porthole, staring out into the sun. Margot, I said. It brings tears to my eyes every time. I mean, just look at that, she exclaimed. I could see the sun out of the porthole, but I wasn't blinded. Why can't I see it? I touched my eyes, half expecting them to be gone too, but I knew that they weren't. Because I want you to, but there are more questions, she whistled the peaceful melody still not turning from the glass. I want to share something with you, this view, come. I looked down at Ted and Jen. I had this horrible fear that my eyes were melting too. What happened to Ted and Jen? I said. This is only supposed to be shared with one. It's a polite protocol, she explained. What is? What are you talking about, Margot? letting you know why. It's a painful thing to have to wonder, at least one you shouldn't. One of you should know, and I'm going to tell you, starting at the beginning, but keeping it brief. I said nothing, and I just listened to her. Look at all those stars. I looked beyond the sun to where thousands of stars twinkled, and Margot continued. Every creature I've ever encountered thinks it's beautiful, their world, the universe, and God, I do too. It's gorgeous, she hissed. Absolutely gorgeous. If only this feeling could be bottled, sold, and forced. The scale of space. The beauty of it all makes greed and worldly power seem so silly. I shifted on my feet uneasily. I had a handgun for emergencies and started towards my locked drawer to grab it. You would think a species could evolve past such things. But that's the fatal flaw of poisoning the purity of all things. You see, even when life reaches the level of sentience to appreciate goodness and beauty, it still can never leave nature behind the primal drive to accumulate power, the high that comes with it, the subjugating of the weak, the slaughtering of the unknown, the slaughtering of anything that could be a threat. All those basic instincts remained, she explained, still gazing out the porthole. 
Margo was still facing the window and I started thumbing the combination into the lock. Your species did not win its way to the top of the food chain with song and dance. There is no solar system where intelligence ever has been. So, all who wonder at the natural world in which they inhabit are built with the cruelty it requires to take it. To lay waste to the competition and those instincts and the need to implement them can't be erased. There is no technology or time elapsed from when we were beasts to rid us of our want to win at all costs. Margot. There is no time for this type of philosophy. I stopped fiddling with the combination and looked at her back. I'm not philosophizing, she said, and then turned. And I blanched as I saw that her eyes were pupilless orbs. Something swam in them like parasites. I'm apologizing to you. What? I stuttered. She was one of them. She was an alien. Anything but human. You can have it then, I shouted, and take as much energy as you need. Please, please, I could give a fuck. Get as much sun as you want. It's not that big of a deal. It's certainly big enough for us all to enjoy it. Energy, Margot shot back. I realized Margot's mouth wasn't moving, but she was slack-jawed. Her voice came from inside my head. We're not here for energy. I'm sorry to you and your people, her voice echoed. Suddenly, the top of Margot's head popped and a slick metal pole that had been coming from the roof slinked out. It paused in the ceiling, creating a barrier from the vacuum of space. Margot's body fell lifeless to the floor. Her eyeballs had been sucked into her skull just like Jin and Ted. She had never been speaking. She'd been dead the entire time. Whatever spoke was what had been hiding behind the sun. I thought about going to the comm station then. Its lights were still on and I could connect to the internet and send out a message to tell the others. And I have. You're listening to it now. But before I did, something seemed to call me to the window. I could see some kind of obella structure nearly touching the sun. It was enormous with emerald lights shining down its length. But then I noticed it had something like tentacles that were reaching into the sun. Where they connected to the surface, angry storms of fire swirled and I understood what they were apologizing for. The sun wasn't being mined. No, no, the words of that thing rang in my head. The slaughtering of the unknowns, the slaughtering of everything that could be a threat, it reminded me. I stared at the sun and from fear or beauty or both, I began to cry. They were increasing the sun's activity. The solar storms suddenly all made sense to me. Soon our star would go supernova. The sun wasn't being mined. No, no, no. What they were doing to the sun is turning it into a bomb. And their plans are to explode it, Earth, and the galaxies and kill us all.